Schütze. F1, right? Okay. We're almost putting the finishing touches to get started. We have uh, quite a few things to do today. So um, we're just going to wait for one of the students who ducked out a minute, and he'll be right back. Um, first of all, I'd just like to welcome you all to Arizona State University. How many of you have been here before or attend ASU? All right, great. So most of you are familiar with the campus. We're, um, today we're going to um, have a series of presentations and also have interaction with you um, on several topics about graduate education and about what we're trying to do at ASU and the Hispanic Research Center. And you're also going to see uh, the mentors here that we work closely with and um, well, they'll be presenting and you'll be interacting with them as well during the course of the day. Um, I'm just stalling for time, <laughs> see if it comes back. So just a couple of things. If you, ha if you haven't figured out where the restrooms are, if you just go out this, this door, you sneak around, this is kind of a hidden room. And it's uh, just like Yankee Stadium. There's a pillar right in the middle of the room, so it's kind of blocked. So that's why I want to walk around a little bit. But if you walk out here and you make a right, and then all the way down the hall make a left, there are some restrooms. And um, so you can figure that out. Is what? Both directions. They're both directions, but the other ones I think are kind of old. <laughs> These are a little bit better maintained, the one by the elevator. Um, let's see what other things. Uh, we are videotaping this, and part of the reason is we, we have a series of conferences and seminars and workshops that we videotape. And so um, we do this in snippets as well. We put things up on the web. So if you're curious and if you want to learn more about what we've done in the past, I can point you to that. It's a pretty easy website to find. And then uh, as well for, for any of the students, there was at least one student who wanted to come here, but th that student's presenting a paper at a conference. And so that way the student can review the video and see what, what, it all, what we talked about today. So any other uh, housekeeping items in, before I start? All right. Okay, so uh, I'm going to first start off by letting you know uh, who we are. My name is Antonio Garcia, and I'm a professor here of uh, bioengineering in the Harrington Department of Bioengineering. I'm also associate director of the Hispanic Research Center. And the Hispanic Research Center is a center that's been around since the mid-1980s at ASU. And uh, we do quite a number of things, but about I would say a, a good chunk of the center is devoted to programs involving students in science, math, and engineering, and technology. And more specifically, what we're trying to do is basically change the university. Not just this university, but at least with our alliance of universities in the Southwest, and also the university, meaning the, Amer the American University. And the way we're doing this is through um, a series programs, which I don't want to go into too much detail, but I'll give you some background on. And, um, and, but we target underrepresented minority students. Now, uh, these programs were, would be impossible if not for the staff that we have at HRC. And really, we all call ourselves, you know, we have staff and then we all call ourselves colleagues and collaborators in the center. We try to do everything we can together. When, if some of you have been to our conferences, you know that Everybody's out there pitching in and, uh, because it's such a big event. But from uh, the people here that you've probably interacted with already, we have uh, Laura and Greta, who are over here on this table, and uh, Liz as well, who's popped in and out. And so she's also that plays a great role in uh, making sure all these happens. And then Eric here is our videographer and multimedia wizard and makes sure that a lot of things that we need to do in that regard. And then the, the person who really started these programs are uh, Michael Sullivan, who's the executive director, and he's in the back. Uh, he started Project 1000 with Dr. Gary Keller, who would be here today, but he's in Alaska on a cruise. Uh, he works 24-7, but every once in a while, they manage, his wife manages to put him in a boat or something for a while so he can get away. 
Um, but he, Gary Keller and Michael Sullivan started Project 1000 uh, in SUNY Binghamton. And this was a project designed at the, at the time to deal with the idea that, uh, or the problem, that Hispanic students weren't going into doctoral programs. Um, and so they devised a series of, of things and, uh, that they need to do, partnerships, and raised a lot of funds, and actually brought the program to ASU about 1987 or 88, somewhere in that, uh, 87 and then 88, kind of went to full, uh, full operation here at, at the Hispanic Research Center. So Project 1000 is something that you, I think most of you are probably aware of. And uh, that was our first program. And uh, from that, uh, a couple of years later, we, uh, I got involved and Dr. Albert McHenry, who's another one of our close collaborators, got involved in the um, National Science Foundation program known as the Alliance for Minority Participation at that time. And uh, without getting into more of that detail, I think, did the gentleman come back? I don't know if I didn't notice if he came back. Okay, <laughs> I don't know what happened to him. Um, but in our center, just to give you a little bit more information on our center, we pride ourselves in collaborating with, with people who make a difference. And uh, you'll, be, you'll have a treat today, you'll have a series of faculty, of several faculty, who will come and uh, talk to you. And these folks are making uh, really an incredible contribution. And one of them is here. I don't know if you, probably a lot of you know him, Carlos Castillo Chavez. He's from mathematics. And uh, Carlos has uh, been uh, a driving force in, uh, in here at ASU and uh, internationally as well in his research. And uh, some of you have been involved in the Math and Theoretical Biology Institute, which is a great summer program that just finished a few days ago. They had a banquet for that. And then we have from Chemistry and Biochemistry, who will come later on this morning, is Professor Anna Moore. And she um, has been working closely with us. And she's been at ASU for quite a long time. And she works on uh, solar energy. And she's got a lot of international collaborations. And she does a great job in terms of uh, mentoring students as well as helping us in that area of chemistry. And then Ferran Garcia Pichel, he's a microbiologist and he's again another one of our close colleagues and that uh, works in the uh, School of Life Sciences. And we have many, many others, but these, these three uh, co uh, faculty members we're calling co-coordinators of um, this Bridges to the Doctorate program. So you're here today because we have the opportunity through the National Science Foundation to provide 12 fellowships. This keeps cutting out, so I'm gonna to try to make sure it doesn't cut out. We, we're, we have 12 fellowships through the National Science Foundation that would start this month, actually, and uh, continue for two years. And this is designed to do very specifically um, one thing, and that is to take students who uh, are at, before they complete a master's degree in science, math, and engineering or technology fields, and get them funding, get them the opportunity in terms of resources um, to go on to a doctorate degree. So obviously two years and a PhD, it's possible, but uh, very few people do that, but it's a bridge to the doctorate, so it's not a doctorate fellowship program per se, it's a bridge to it. And in our program, we, uh, this is what the National Science Foundation provides um, through uh, the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, or the LSAM program. In our program, um, we view this bridge to the doctorate as an important component, a critical component in changing the face of the university. Um, as a lot of you know, um, we have in higher education a lot of different issues. We have competitive issues uh, with the rest of the world catching up and some, some people may say even uh, uh, getting ahead of the United States in key areas of science, math, and engineering. We have in higher education the cost issue for undergraduates primarily. And we also have the human resource issue. So for us, 
uh, at ASU and our colleagues, we really focus on the human resource issue because we think that the human resource issue is the key to solve all of these other issues. Um, and hopefully, um, the human resource issue is one that's complicated in the United States. Just uh, this morning, I think, because I wake up at about 3.30 in the morning. I don't know if it was this morning or last night because it's all a blur when you wake up that early. Um, there was a new census about how white, non-Hispanic population of the United States is quickly becoming the minority. So I think one in every 10 counties in the United States, whites, non-Hispanics are becoming the, are the minority. Now this is a serious thing from a couple of perspectives. One is that there is no sign that, that this demographic change is, is slowing down or even being linear. It's actually accelerating. And so this catches a lot of people by surprise. Uh, especially states that are, you would normally think of as being the Middle West, uh, the kind of the heartland, places like Nebraska, which you think, oh, you know, there aren't that, they should be mostly farmers in Nebraska, and you find out that Nebraska is quickly becoming uh, a huge number of uh, Hispanic students uh, are showing up in the public schools. You, get, you take places like North Carolina, where North Carolina has the same issues that Arizona has in terms of sheer numbers of undocumented uh, uh, immigrants. And so you start seeing that all over the, the country, this is, a, this is a big demographic change. Now that's a good thing, is that that's why the United States is so powerful. Myself, I came to the United States as a Cuban refugee. So with my family, I was too small to be a political adjutant, and I couldn't kill Fidel at the age of three. I would have tried, but I, I wouldn't have been successful. Throwing a diaper at him, maybe. But, um, but here in the United States, you have the opportunity. Anybody has the opportunity to have freedom and to be able to succeed. But we have to be competitive with the rest of the world. With a demographic shift, we don't see a demographic shift at, at the same level, at the same intensity at the undergraduate, even at the graduating high school level, much less at the undergraduate level, much less in science, math, and engineering, and much, much less at the doctorate level. And even less, if you can count them on the number of you know, fingers on your hand, how many unrepresented minority PhDs go into faculty positions in science, math, and engineering. In some years, uh, computer science, maybe there's one. You know, things like that. The numbers are totally out of whack. And so the National Science Foundation gets money from Congress to say you have to do something to change this human resource issue. We get funding from uh, the National Science Foundation because people like Michael Sullivan, Dr. Gary Keller have been doing this for over, let's say over 25 years easily, almost th uh, 30 years I should say. You know, between 20 and 30 years, depending on how you want to count it uh, when they first started uh, these, uh, these types of programs. And at ASU, we have uh, at least 100 years of experience just between the four of us that you're going to see today about graduate education and research in science, math, and engineering. So uh, that's, that's the part that the intro I wanted to give you is the idea is that, that uh, we're very serious. Dr. Carlos Castillo Chavez, Dr. Garcia Fer uh, uh, Fer Ferran Garcia Pichel, Dr. Anna Moore, Michael Sullivan, Dr. Gary Keller, myself, uh, and Dr. Albert McHenry, we are deadly serious about this issue of getting students who are the future of this nation into doctoral programs, into the professoriate, because we think that without that, we're quickly in the United States going to lose competitive edge, we're going to lose probably freedoms uh, when we're dealing with a lot of issues of resources, as you know, around the world, prices of oil, access to technology, and uh, internet, things like that, where you see the rest of the world doesn't value the same kinds of freedoms that we value here in the United States. So in this program, um, for the Bridge to Doctorates, you know, one program of many programs around the country, we are committed to making sure that we find students, and that's why people, you have our mentors who identify you, who are here today, and uh, they know, they're experts in identifying students who have the capability. Part of the thing that uh, we want to talk about today is how committed are you uh, to go on to the PhD? 
and also how committed are you to follow the advice of, like I would say, about over 100 years of experience. We've done this four other times. We've had four, this is our fifth successful year of providing fellowships through the National Science Foundation. So it's easy for, and we actually have a new program for teaching this year. So the National Science Foundation, uh, you know, just like a customer keeps coming back and providing us the resources. They think that we do a good job and we want to, and we know uh, we have to answer to our own uh, values in terms of making sure that we prepare students and we also have to answer to them to say yes the money was well spent. Um, in the other four cohorts that we've had, we had a very good success uh, in terms of getting students into the doctoral program, getting them on the way. It may not be the cleanest, you know, four years and you're out, but we can get them. And the reason we can get them is because we have really committed mentors. Uh, and I could say the a lion's share that goes to Carlos Castillo Chavez, who puts in a lot of effort uh, that is uh, above and beyond things that the students even see to make sure that the, that the students are successful and they can get into doctoral programs and, and manage to get uh, through the system. Mathematics is a pretty tough field. Those of you who are mathematicians, I, uh, I know how tough it is. I hear all of the of the things, you, the hoops that you guys have to go through in the PhD programs. In bioengineering or in engineering, we have different kinds of hoops. Uh, so, so it's hard for me to say exactly which is harder than the other, but it's certainly uh, very demanding. Now we know that uh, doctoral programs aren't for everybody, so, but you've already been selected because people think that you have the capacity to do it. You've already uh, made an initial statement that you are interested in doing this. So, um, but we see that many times uh, there are difficulties, there are barriers. And let me just point out a couple of key barriers that we've seen specifically with this fellowship program and probably with all graduate students. The, the most important thing in a graduate program is not necessarily how smart you are, all right? Uh, graduate programs demand creativity, persistence, communication, and the ability to do things and learn things in different ways than you did as an undergraduate. You can't take a graduate program and say, I'm going to study math until you know, I know more than anybody else in the world and I'm going to just read this book and I'm going to read, I'm going to take a hundred classes and I'm going to do all of this stuff and I'm going to be the world's best mathematician. That is not the way to get a PhD. That's a way to probably make a career out of it and probably be just something you would want to do. Same in engineering. You don't become a PhD in engineering because you've, you've uh, taken a thousand classes and engineering or whatever it is, take you know, 20 credit hours every semester. Uh, that's not it. To, to get into a PhD program, you have to want to uh, devote uh, your career and probably a good chunk of your life to studying a field and approaching it kind of, my analogy in terms of graduate education is approaching it like you would approach being a performer, uh, like being a musician or being an actor is you have to be creative. You have to know enough about the field, so you have to know the fundamentals, and you have to know, you have to be rigorous, and you have to understand the tools of, of the qualitative, quantitative, theoretical, experimental tools. But you have to know more than that. You have to know not just your own field, you have to understand how that relates to other fields and how that relates to the world, because society is what really who pays us those of us who are in the knowledge business, we get paid by the public for the most, most of the, our funding comes from the public. We don't create a product. You know, Carlos is not out there making math widgets. I'm not making bioengineering widgets and selling them. That's for companies to do. We um, look at the world in the, the way that we do in terms of our research, in terms of our teaching, and we add value to it. We add some creative touches to it. I know that there are a lot of students out there who are more than capable. I have, I've had in my classes a lot of undergraduates who are probably much smarter than me. Even the freshmen know a lot more than I do. 
but I know that they would be a disaster being faculty or getting a PhD because it's not just about that. There are other elements to it. And so, um, again, the biggest stumbling block that we see with students is uh, that they're afraid to do something new. They're afraid to fail and they're afraid to get out of their comfort zone, especially in engineering. And so in graduate education, that's what you have to do because now it's no longer here's a curriculum, take the courses and you're done. Now it's more, I gotta talk to my mentor, I gotta know when I need to talk to my mentor, I gotta know who my mentor is. I gotta figure out when should I talk to my mentor. I need to figure out what can I do with my mentor. I need to figure out who are my peers. Who should be my peers? And then who are they? What, what, can, I, what can I do with them that'll make it, uh, that'll make it uh, together something that we can produce, a paper we can produce, uh, research we can produce, even teaching, some kind of teaching elements that are not there, a course or whatever that's not available. So again, this idea of creating something um, new. And the other thing is to be persistent. So creativity, part of creativity is being persistent. Obviously, those of you who are familiar, who played sports, who have done performing, you know that you just can't do something cold for the first time and do it right. So persistence is you have to practice, you have to take classes, you have to know your limitations, you have to listen to advice, you have to have somebody who can guide you through that. And I know a lot of students can't make that transition. 4.0 students, 4.33, and here at ASU we have A pluses, so 4.33 students, I think many of them don't have the abilities to go into the doctoral program. Um, it's that kind of quality of the student that we rely on mentors uh, that who brought you here who know that you have that potential. But the follow through is the most important. So following through, even if you have the potential, even if uh, you're willing to be creative, even if you're willing to take advice, uh, and, and, and apply it. So not just take advice, but actually follow through with that. The next thing you have to realize in a PhD program is that you have to delay gratification. All right? Um, too many fellowship programs that we're aware of, the first thing that people do when they get, they find out they have a $30,000 fellowship is they go out and buy a new car, or buy a house, or buy a cell phone business, or do something like that. I'm going to tell you right now that 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 is a, a, a symptom of a bigger disease. If somebody does that, with the first thing they want to do with that money, because immediately that signals that should signal to the person and signals to everyone else that you're really not serious with doing what you need to do at this point in your lives and your careers. What you need to do is say, I'm not only going to have anything I want to have. 10, 20 years from now, but more importantly, I'm going to have a job that's one of the most prestigious jobs in the United, in the United States, is now being a faculty member. Uh, that's one of the top five, they did a survey recently, that's one of the top five jobs. Why do I need to have all of this stuff when I could be somebody like Carlos Castillo Chavez that, that gets invitations to give plenary talks all the way around the world anytime he wants to without spending a dime on that? Or, uh, Someone um, who can be called by uh, National Science Foundation or the Office of the President to, to make pronouncements or be on a committee that will change the course of science, change the course of education, change the course of research and development in this country. Um, these kinds of things are things that you, can, you all will be able to do with a PhD and especially being a faculty member. And so the gratification of today, you know, is, is uh, to me, um, it's an empty thing. It's something that everyone needs. Everyone needs to live somewhere. People need to get to their house, or from their house to their job. So there are some needs that everyone has. But somehow the idea that uh, all too often people who haven't thought about this uh, or haven't had a lot of a lot in terms of growing up, and I would put myself in one of those uh, categories. Not having that, just having a decent enough house in Jersey, um, 
not having a car till I was in my middle 20s at least, and it was just an old car, not having my first new car till I was in my mid-30s. Um, those kinds of things is, is a tough thing to do, as everyone, especially nowadays, with how material we are. You know, I, I should talk, I have a Blackberry on one side and a cell phone on the other. But, but it's when you want to do that. It's good for me to do that now in my stage. It's not a good idea for you all to do that as you're getting a PhD. By getting a, a house, buying a house immediately after getting their first check, which I, we know people that have done this, you've already limited a lot of the things that you're going to do and you now are the, the next thing you're going to think about is how do I keep paying the mortgage on this house? By buying a nice car, again, you're at the same thing. How do I make the payments? And then how do I have enough money to do all the other things? So there are a lot of life choices that, that are best kept in insight you know, or done at a very gradual pace as you get towards your PhD. And this is, a, this is not an easy thing to say to everybody, and, and it's not an easy thing to do, but it's something to think about. If I were to spend, the value of the fellowship is around $90,000 roughly. So if somebody were to give you $90,000, you have to ask yourself, if I was given a check for $90,000, what would I do with this money? So if the answer is I'm going to you know, go into Vegas and blow it, that's, you know, that's not a good, good use of money. So if the answer is I'm going to put it in, uh, in the bank and I'm going to slowly draw from it so I can support myself while I do what I need to do so that the rest of my career, so the rest of my life I'm doing when I'm, in, when I'm 40, when I'm 50, when I'm uh, 45, 55, 65, 75, people are never going to retire by the time we get through with Social Security. Um, here you're going to have to work till you're 80. Um, then, uh, then you're set up for the rest of your life. So, so I want you to think about those things as an introduction to, to today. And what we're going to do is, um, we're still having technical difficulties. Okay. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to have uh, a little bit of discussions with you during in the next uh, few hours. We'll have some lunch. And then we'll come back to this, to knowing a little bit more about you. I know that I've just been standing here uh, talking, but I just want to start start you thinking about some some things before we uh, we get through with our uh, with our more formal talks. Um, just a little bit more background and uh, what I do um, in bioengineering. I I focus more on experimental work, and I work in the area of nanotechnology. And uh, so I'm just applying some uh, ideas of applied physics and nanotechnology to improve medical diagnostic equipment. You'll, yeah, you'll never get this to work, though. These are wireless, so. Um, and in, in, um, in that research, uh, some of the benefits of that, again, is it's an interesting area. And so my research group, one of the things we're focused on is to try to figure out a way of making uh, medical testing that are that is disease relevant more accessible, so that people can can uh, guide their own health as well as getting treatment faster and hopefully getting uh, getting uh, cured rather than letting diseases go to the stage where it's much more difficult and much more expensive to treat. So in this research, it's it's kind of interesting. Some of my graduate students get to go. Uh, work with people overseas. We work with people in North Carolina State as well recently and uh, we're publishing a lot of papers, patents, and things like that. So it's, it's an interesting area and then because I worked in industry for a couple of times uh, between undergraduate and graduate school and then after I got my PhD worked in industry I had a little bit more background in terms of design and so I teach the freshman uh, bioengineering design course, which is kind of fun to, to see how uh, these, these very bright students, like I said, the brightest ones are the ones who struggle the most sometimes with uh, engineering design because it's not about reading, reading a book and, 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 um, and doing the test. So I'm very much into this idea of approaching 
science and engineering uh, from a creative perspective. So I'm going to turn this over uh, to Carlos Castillo Chavez, who's going to talk to you. And uh, we're scheduled after Carlos, we're scheduled to have Professor Ana Moore sometime after 10 a.m. And so we're trying to keep the, I know that we started a little bit late, but we're going to try to keep to that schedule. So Carlos, I think you have the, you have the option of using this mic. Okay. But you have to use something because it's hard to hear okay, back there. Or you can use that one. Oh, I forgot. Okay, thank you, Carl. Oh, I'm, being, I'm being recorded. <laughs> I cannot make my typical jokes. So, does he record in Spanish? Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so one of the things that I <coughs> want to do is to to get to know a little bit uh, about you and to have some discussion with you uh, just regarding what is your expectations. I'll ask a few questions uh, to some of you. Um, so, but first, quickly, why don't we go around and then um, uh, you tell me uh, uh, what do you think you are doing here today? <laughs> OK. And we would, you know, we will have volunteers. Uh, so, uh, so why don't you start? <laughs> See, this is the volunteer system here. Why don't we? Uh, well, okay. So I'll I'll just move around and away oh we can. But then he won't be recorded, right? No, that's fine. Can I come to the front? So okay. Okay. We'll. <laughs> and uh, we need to have some good-looking people on the system here. So <laughs> go ahead. Did you choose me? Uh, so you you volunteer. You raise your hand. <laughs> uh, David Shabbat from San Antonio, Texas. Um, Carlos graduated my BA in pure math. I'm here to do my PhD in pure mathematics. And yeah. I think we're here today to eat and uh, also learn about the, uh, the fellowship, the NSF. So okay, no, that that sounds good. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, who wants to be next? Uh, okay, Carl. Get it over with. <laughs> Get it over with. <laughs> uh, my name is Carl Ballard the second, as you can see. Um, from Birmingham, Alabama. I got my degree. Hello? Okay. Okay. Um, I got my degree in uh, mathematics at Alabama State University. I recently attended MTBI here with Carlos uh, for the summer. Um, I plan on going further in applied mathematics. And I believe we're here today to learn more about the Bridge to Doctorate program. And that's really it. Okay, thank you. I can, uh, let me see. Um, no, I can't see your name, so I cannot tell you, but I'll memorize it to Erin Schultz. Okay. Yeah, I think whether you come to the front, otherwise they will scold me for not doing my job. No. No, say it again. Okay, so new equipment. Okay, good. Okay, maybe better now. Yeah. My name is Erin Schultz. I'm from the University of New Mexico, and I've lived in New Mexico most of my life. And I'm going to be studying um, behavioral endocrinology here in the Department of Biology. And I guess I'm here for the same reason everyone else is, to learn about the um, NSF grant. And that's it. OK, that sounds good. Uh, let's see. Uh, Edme. OK. Since, since you disappeared and missed half of the first 15 minutes. Um, my name is uh, Edna Soho. Uh -huh. I'm from uh, Oakland State University in New Jersey. Uh, basically, uh, as Carl, I'm uh, here uh, with uh, the help of uh, Dr. Carlos Chavez uh, to learn about the opportunity that we may have uh, to really uh, bridge this gap between uh, the minority in uh, other fields and uh, the doctor degree. So it will be a wonderful opportunity to learn more. And uh, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I say you must be from Puerto Rico or something? OK. I read your files, that's why. <laughs> you, can <come. laughs> you have to come here. It's not that I'm. Can you hear me? Is this working? I can. OK. 
Okay, Yaralit, is that what you name? Yeah. So okay. My name is Yaralit. Um, I make my bachelor in Puerto Rico um, in microbiology. I've been working in ASU um, for about two years in an infectious diseases lab um, that is specialized in virology. Um, and that program is like a sponsor for NIH. So now I will start my master in the same area. And I think I'm here to learn more about the fellowship. The person that you work is an expert on? Um, Brenda Ho. Yeah, and what is an expert on? What is her field of expertise? Um, virology. A any particular? Um, we work with the family of coronaviruses, and in that family is SARS coronavirus, like in, like in China a few years ago. So we work with those viruses. Okay. But you don't touch them, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we, we just want to be sure that we don't have a problem here. Eric. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Eric Kennedy. I'm uh, originally from Texas, but I went to U of A. Um, I studied math and biology. And I'm here to learn more about the Bridgeway PhD program. So, so do people from Texas stick together all the time? Is of course. Okay, I oh understand. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Okay. Okay, Kenny. <laughs> what are you doing? Hi, I'm uh, Kenny Salau, and I'm here from St. Mary's College of Maryland. I graduated with my BA in paramathematics. I'm now trying to make the, uh, the jump to applied math. Um, I attended NCBI twice, which is Dr. Casillas Chavez's program, and um, I believe we're here today because we have a tremendous opportunity to, you know, to get, I mean, to to do something as far as getting towards our PhD, so I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited about this. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, notice that he had to take the same course twice, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a. We have a first year and an advanced version. Okay, uh, Emmanuel, you only had to take it once, right? I think. Yeah. In yeah. And it was in Spanish for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my name is Emmanuel. I'm from Universidad Metropolitana from Puerto Rico. And I'm glad to be here. And I spent this last summer in the CBI program. That was great. And that's all. I'm here for, for learning about the fellowship. And Okay. Um, let me see. I have to look at Yusuf. Okay. <laughs> Another biologist. We have a lot of biologists here today. <laughs> Hi. My name is Yusuf. I uh, went to UA, studied physiology. Um, originally from Arizona. I grew up in Chandler. Um, I just, you know, heard about the fellowship offer just, you know, not too long ago. So I'm excited to be here to meet all these new people. And I, you know, hope to take some more time here. Uh, you see, you seem to be having like 20 different jobs at the same time. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Um, actually, yeah. right now, um, I I found my you know I've been working with my advisor this past summer in the lab, been doing some some imaging and neuron stuff, and I uh, also work for you know uh, do the finances in the machine shop in Gilbert, and I run around town a lot. And you were also the manager of a lab or something? Yeah, I was a lab manager in Tucson for uh, okay. for a pulmonary lab. Okay. And, uh, uh, what do you do in your free time? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just, uh, well, anyway, I was just <laughs> wondering. Okay, um, so let me see. Okay, um, Sharquita, maybe I'll get your name right this time. I've been trying to pronounce her name all summer. So <laughs> I think we have to come here by the, for the camera so that uh, they can actually take a or something like that. <laughs> Sharquita Tatum. I'm from Selma, Alabama. I currently attend Alabama A&M University, where I'm majoring in mathematics, and I'll get my BS in December. Um, I'm here today to learn more about the Bridge Program, and I think that's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have another Mexican here, Chambliss. Okay. Who hasn't returned? You haven't returned your computer, by the way. Uh, yeah. So I just got an email about it. <laughs> Take the opportunity to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, my name is Walter Chambliss, and I'm originally from Florida, and I went to also went to Alabama State with Paul. Uh, I, I also attended the uh, NCBI program. This is one of the fun, and uh, it was a good experience for me. Originally, I wanted to do mechanical engineering, but I think applied mathematics is a better transition for me. 
so you are at ASU? Yes. OK, this is Alabama State University. But they don't put it that way, right, on the website. I think there was a, no. Um, yeah, because I think, uh, I think uh, ASU beat you to the copyright for that name, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, something like that. I, I just was. So, so, so let, me, let me just talk a little bit uh, about, um, let me tell you a little bit about what, is, what has been my career, so you have some sort of idea. I, um, I studied in, in pure mathematics. I studied uh, set theory and did my master's degree on that. I was very interested in uh, proving theorems about something called the continuum hypothesis. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and the continuum hypothesis, for some of you that are uh, some interest, you essentially you start counting. So you go one, two, three, four, and that's uh, some sort of level of infinity. Then you think about fractions, and that happens to be that you think about fractions that are not much bigger than the counting numbers. And then you talk about um, uh, essentially a continuum, and that's, uh, that turns out to be a larger infinity. That's, that's part of the essence. Uh, but um, as you know, uh, it, you can order the numbers. You can have one, two, three, but you cannot order the rational numbers. But there are ways to order larger numbers. And, um, and that leads you to what is called uh, the field of transfinite numbers. So you can see how I wasted my time doing so. And, and when you do that, then the, one of the questions is, you have the first transfinite number, which is not like counting is that equivalent to um, the continuum to the real numbers? That was one of the questions. And um, uh, uh, just, to say, just to show you what can people can do, there was a, a group of policy mathematicians uh, that actually were very, very hard on that, and uh, very, very small group. And they uh, very quickly became some of the most prominent mathematicians in the world. And most of those was destroyed by World War II by the attack on the Jewish population that have to lead. But the, the, uh, the general perspective that I learned from those and, uh, is was that it takes a very, very small group of people to actually do something tremendous. Okay? Interestingly enough, they, so they created some critical mass of students. They did uh, this kind of work. Uh, they did some tremendous work. For example, um, you have heard about the Enigma code, uh, and it is attributed to a famous mathematician, but actually where two graduate students, Polish students, that actually broke the code. And when you hear about Turing and things like that, uh, what he found that is a way to do it fast enough so that the information could come fast enough. But the actual code was broke, uh, broken by graduate students like you on the first year of students, and they actually went and actually solved that problem. Uh, so I was very interested on, on, on that area of, of pure mathematics, and, uh, and I started my, um, essentially, my master's degree at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And uh, this was around 1976. And then uh, at that time, uh, I, I was a very good student. And I chose what was called the best known professor at that university. His name is uh, Frederick Bagemil. Uh, so he was the most distinguished professor. He was um, maintained tremendous distance from his students. So he invited his best student his, uh, uh, to come to his best former student to come to the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee to give a talk. And uh, this student, his name is Paul Homke. He's a, a professor of mathematics at um, uh, one of these small colleges in Minnesota. That is actually very good. I just forgot his name of this. Um, this college. But anyway, he's uh, one of these very famous colleges in Minnesota. And uh, Paul, Paul Humke, which uh, among other things, um, is very involved in there is a ma program to train mathematicians in Eastern Europe, in Hungary. So he takes a lot of students there. He wrote an incredible thesis. I mean, and let me tell you, just out of the said, most of the PhD thesis are not very good. They're just very minimal. But in his case, it was a very incredible thesis that were like, 400 pages of theorems and things like that uh, about a topic called ambiguous uh, sets, uh, points of functions. And uh, that topic has to do, you typically can find that when a function has a derivative and when a function is continuous. Well, his theorems were about arbitrary functions. So that's, uh, I never even know that. So I was very interested. So I read his thesis. And I read all the papers of this famous school of policy mathematicians that included uh, people like uh, Sierpinski and, and Lucin and um, 
Stanislav Ulam, and I will get back to Stanislav Ulam later on. And, and then at uh, that point, because I was a very good student, the, when Paul Honky came, he, this professor approached me, who he never really talked to students, and asked me if I wanted to go with him to have uh, dinner with his uh, student. And I, I, was, I think that was the first time that he really talked to me, so I was very excited. And then he asked me to choose the restaurant, so I, I chose the best Mexican restaurant in the south side of Milwaukee. And the cook, of course, was from India. I guess. <laughs> it's a well-kept secret that uh, Mexican men can't cook. But people insist on going to Mexican restaurants. They complain why well, they are not good. And they, you know, it depends. If the cook is Mexican man, then it's not a good restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so we were there. And at that time, uh, affirmative action had started. Um, I went to undergraduate to the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point after I worked at a cheese factory in northern Wisconsin. And this school, there were essentially two Latino students, Jose Vega from Puerto Rico and myself, out of 8,000 students. So it was really easy to find each other. We became good friends, uh, because the, uh, but the ratio of uh, minorities was, at that point, uh, 1 to 4,000. And that it was very interesting. And um, so I, uh, I graduated from there and went to Milwaukee. And uh, at that point, uh, did very well on my courses and had chosen an advisor and was about to take my qualifying exams, which was the ones that put you, make you candidate for the, for the PhD program. So uh, we went to this restaurant. We had uh, dinner. And at, at dinner, there was a, um, a professor of analysis. I remember his name, uh, O'Malley. There was a Chinese professor also of analysis, Lee. There was this uh, Professor Bagamid was Paul Honky and myself. I was the only student invited. And then in the middle of the conversation, uh, my advisor said um, if they have actually read a memo that has just been circulated in the department. Of course, I was a student. What the hell did I know what memo would that be? <laughs> okay. And <clears throat> then he mentioned the memo. And the memo uh, essentially was the beginning of affirmative action, the beginning of the kinds of programs that you are involved here. And he mentioned that you notice that they don't mention Asian people. They mention only Hispanics and blacks. At that time, we were not Latinos. And blacks were not African Americans. We were just blacks, Latinos, Hispanic, and American Indians. And I said they don't mention Asians. And then uh, everybody was, I, I don't think they have even quite read that memo or have paid that much attention. And they said, you know why they don't mention Asians? And uh, they said, why? I said, because they can make it on their own. So that was that, so that was my PhD advisor. So um, that changed my life for various reasons. The first one, I didn't say anything. And that was the last time I didn't say anything. And, and then I went home, and I felt very embarrassed about myself. I said, how can I possibly that happen to me? So the next day, I went and put a petition to change advisor. But he was the most important person in the department. And there is all sorts of departmental politics, which I now understand much better. And none of these politics have to do with quality or we're putting the students first. They have to do with other issues. And you really don't want to know, because then you will. Uh, so he refused. He said that I had to take my oral exams with him. And if I pass them, then he will draw from being my PhD advisor, but not before. So I was not. Uh, uh, dumb enough to know that that was, I, ca I could flunk any student and, uh, and any faculty. And any faculty could flunk me on a math exam. That's, not a, that's a very trivial exercise. So I knew what, what was the, the, the emphasis. Uh, so uh, as a result of that, I, there were several faculty that approached him and said, you know, he's a really good student. We can't just let him go. But he refused. So to their amazement, I quit. So I left, went to work for a bank. And then uh, I applied to the University of Wisconsin at Madison uh, a year later, got a, and other schools, got tons of fellowship offers, couldn't accept fellowship offers because I was married with a child. And so I went to the University of Wisconsin for several reasons. It's an excellent school. And uh, because they had a teaching assistance union, uh, you would get health insurance when you get admitted. And the health insurance will cover your family. 
which was great. In addition, you get cheap housing. I still remember, I used to pay $162 for a two-bedroom apartment at Eagle Heights. And, uh, and so I chose that, and of course, it was an excellent school. And it was a very large school. So that was a big transition in my life. And then I got very involved with um, a new field there, although Madison was very strong in things like logic and set theory change, and I started working on an area called harmonic analysis. Harmonic analysis has to do with uh, complex numbers. And, uh, and it was a very different experience. I became uh, very connected to a large number of prominent mathematicians. So the most prominent mathematician that the biologists have in here, here, but I'll talk about some biologists, was Walter Rudin. So Walter Rudin and Mary Allen Rudin, and you have heard his book about Walter Rudin, they became my close friends. I used to be this tiny apartment in Eagle and they used to come and have dinner with us all the time. And later on, when I finished, I used to come with my family and I stay at his house, which was uh, built by Frank Lloyd Wright, who built Escottsdale. So it's all these connections that happen <laughs> like that. And, uh, and, and uh, what happens is that this community complex analyst, you know, which was one of the strongest in the world, were very supportive in a very large department. But for me to, to find this supported community, I have to present myself. So I found this community extremely supported because I introduced myself, because I went to talk to them. Every day they were having coffee in the ninth floor lounge, which is a beautiful lounge that they overlooks some of the um, lakes there. But I have to make this effort. And I remember when I went there, I saw all the faculty sitting in one corner and all the graduate students in another corner. So I made an instant decision. I'm going to sing with these guys. So I went and sat with those guys. And I sat with those guys uh, the, race, the rest of my state at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And as I, uh, as I, would, I got to know these very interesting people. And the first thing that I found out is once they got to know me, uh, they care about me. So. Uh, Although my interests were not in harmonic analysis, I started taking advanced courses in harmonic analysis. I started going to all the complex analysis seminars, uh, take uh, the highest level courses. So everybody thought that I was going to be a harmonic analysis. And of course, I was not, that was not really wanted to do that. At that point, I had decided somehow I had to do some applications. And so I, I took. Um, courses in partial differential equations, I had many courses in harmonic analysis, I gravitational theory. So I was trying to take whatever. I was trying to figure out where I find application. At that point, um, uh, there was still the remnants of the Vietnam War. And Wisconsin had played a very prominent role on that. There was a bombing of one building and, and so forth. So at that point, the, uh, Wisconsin had a math research center supported by the Army. So I decided I wasn't going to do any kind of research that had to do with anything related to the Army. I'll come back to that then also. So that also limited the kinds of applications that I was going to do. So on my third semester, I was on, decided I'm going to find an advisor. So I approached one of the faculty that was in nonlinear partial differential equations, which is really pure mathematics. Uh, very prominent guy. Uh, which I have met him many times, and he's very proud of my career now. But I don't think he remembers this story. So I asked him if he would be my advisor. And he said, which you know, I think was a good response, actually. He said, I really don't have time, but if you write your own thesis, I'll sign it. Okay, so I thought, well, that's not going to be very helpful. So I went and, so I went and uh, went and uh, met another advisor, my, what turned out to be my peer advisor. His name is Fred Brower. And uh, so he was uh, there. He was part of the same community, but he actually um, did uh, um, mostly differential equations. Um, and his father was the best algebraist of his time. His name was Richard Brower. There is something called Brower groups. And uh, there was almost no algebraist in the country that have not gone through Richard Brower's hands. And so he was the god of algebra. So as his son, he had to go and do something else, right? If I was him, I would have not done mathematics. I <laughs> as far away from mathematics as I could. So he was there, and, and he was doing um, 
he studied with Levinson, and you might have heard his name at MIT, and, and so forth. So, so I start, uh, so I asked him, and he said he was doing things related to mathematical biology. So I asked him, can you give me something to read? So he gave me a book and some papers, and so I went and sort of glanced at them. So next week I say, told him I read them, do you have something more interesting? You know, in mathematics, you have to be arrogant, and I learned that very well. And now I'm, I, I think that that's one of the problems that we have with the field. That's one of the, the, the issues that makes it very hostile. So in order to survive, you start imitating the role models of hostility that you see there. So I was very arrogant. You know, I, uh, I was, as I said, I was a very good student. So sometimes I would spend all night solving a problem. And then I would come, and I see all these grad students unable to solve the problem. And they would ask me, you know, how was it? And oh, it was trivial. It just took me about 10 minutes to do it. And, and there was this culture that generated. And, 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 uh, and I learned it well. So when he told me, say, oh, I read it already. Can you give me something else? So he gave me something else to read and came back a couple of weeks later. And I said, well, this is interesting, but uh, do you have something? Do you have a problem? Because in mathematics, and I think that's part of the problem. We ask people to give you a problem. So the quality of your research, your problems, and things like that depends on the creativity of your advisor. And one of the problems as a graduate student that you will have is that you will think that all professors were created equal, and you won't be able to discriminate between who are the really creative people and talented people and who are not. And that's one of the challenges. So for a graduate student to differentiate that, it's, it's a very, very important thing to do. Because um, your research career is tied in not only uh, with, uh, with, uh, with how hard you work, but also with making choices that are interesting. Right? You can spend all your life working on the most trivial and absurd problem, or you can spend all your life working on an interesting problem. And of course, this applies to biologists very clearly. You know, I remember I met a biologist, uh, and I'll go back later, Stuart Kaufman, when I was a postdoc in a biology department. And he asked me, he told me, um, in fact, we were in the, the bathroom, you know, just men can talk in the bathroom, you know, just. And uh, as we were um, sort of looking at each other, um, he, he said, you know, Carlos, let me give you a piece of advice. And he's, uh, MacArthur Award winners, a very famous biologist, Stuart Kaufman, he said, you know, don't work in problems that nobody cares. Because you just work just as hard and nobody cares. So why should you waste your time doing that? Uh, in his case, he's been working all his life on the origin of life. And of course, out of that has done a lot of very interesting research, experiments, mathematics, all sorts of things. And everybody wants to know the origin of life. So that's an interesting question. And so. So a lot of people work in areas that nobody cares, because that way they have no competition. So that's part of the issue that you have that you decide to. And of course, that doesn't mean that you're going to go and jump into an area where there are 5,000 people working. The clever thing is to find out right, a new direction or an area where um, essentially uh, research, uh, there are interesting questions that people want to know and where there is still not a lot of research. I mean, that's, that's what, what people do. Just like uh, the, the coronavirus and SARS, there was very little known about that, and and, and so forth. So that's just as an example of of, of doing that. Um, 